Hey y'all, welcome back to the last major conceptual video of the third lecture series on uh, exponential change. So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about a fluid system that exemplifies exponential change. We're going to talk about the electrical analog of that fluid system, which involves uh, a new circuit component called a capacitor. Um, and we are going to discuss the ways that capacitors act within a circuit. Um, yeah, so this video is the culmination of all that math theory that we were working with in the past few lectures, uh, lecture videos. So this is finally pulling it back to the physics, the real physical systems. We're going to be referencing a lot of the concepts we discussed, discussed in video two. So if there are any concepts that you're a little iffy on, or if you're not sure how I went from one step to the other, um, it may be useful to go back there. Um, cool. In the following video, we'll be talking about a few examples, so we'll be doing some intuition builders and wrap up. So this is the last major concepts video. Let's hop in. Okay, applications to physical systems. The first archetype I wanted to talk to y'all about is the fluid case. So in the fluid case, um, I think about two reservoirs. So I've got two reservoirs. I'm going to draw them like kind of like silos here. So one's a cylindrical reservoir, the other one is also a cylindrical reservoir. Okay, so they're cylindrical reservoirs. I'm going to say that they have some cross-sectional area, A. And let's say that they each have the same cross-sectional area for convenience. And we've got two levels of fluid in them at time t equals zero. So I'm going to call this height on the left HL. And I'm going to call this height on the right HR. So on the left pipe, this HL, uh, HL is going to be, in general, a function of time. time. And same for the right one. So this initial height, I'm going to call HL, oops, HL not, HL0, and HR not at time t equals 0. OK. So what's going to happen is, over time, fluid is going to flow through this little joining of the pipes here, such that at the end, uh, they will be at the same level. So the height in each pipe will be uh, equilibrated to the same value at the end. So the final value, h final, for either the left or the right pipe, as, t, as, as time goes out to infinity, is just the average of their two initial heights, h l naught plus H R not. Okay, over two. All right. <clears throat> so this will be discussed in greater detail in your DL. Um, I want to bring in one more caveat, which is that there is some resistance in the pipe. R. All right. So I'm not going to do the entire derivation because uh, the derivation can be a little bit boring to just watch. It's much more fun to actually like interact with and do on your own in DL. So I want to give a couple pieces of intuition, and then I'll just let you know how the height varies over time. That's the thing that I'm really interested in here. So uh, a few pieces of intuition. The first is that regardless of the area of the pipe, pressure is going to be dependent on the height of water uh, only. So the pressure at the level of the transfer pipe delta t is going to be dependent on the height of the of the water only. So um, the rate at which water transfers through this resistive pipe is not going to be dependent on the area, but only on the, uh, the height, only on the pressure down there. OK. However, the amount of water that needs to be exchanged in order to, uh, in order to equilibrate the two pipes to that equilibrium level where they're both at the same height the amount of water that needs to be exchanged in order for that to happen increases with area. So the volume of a cylinder, volume of a cylinder, is given by the area of the cylinder times the height, times the height. So if I've got a larger area, I'm going to have a larger volume. And if I've got a greater height of water in the pipe, that means I'm going to have to transfer more water, uh, even though I've got the same, like a uh, I'm going to have to transfer more water, even though I've got the same change in pressure at a given height, if I increase my area. OK, so all that's to say that 
the rate at which water transfers is going to be dependent on the height only and not the area. However, the time it takes for all of that water to transfer, now that involves the area because uh, the, the greater the area I have, the more um, water overall I have to shift to make the heights equal. Okay, so again, you'll show this more conclusively, like less hand wavily in your lab, but it turns out that the height, the, I should really say the difference in height as a function of time, is going to be the initial difference in height, uh, initial, times the exponential of negative rho times g over a times r. So rho is the density of the water, g is the gravitational constant for acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared, a is the cross-sectional area of one of the pipes, and r is the uh, resistance of this internal area or of this uh, of this connecting pipe. So a few things to note. Let's draw this back to our rate parameter. Um, so in the context of our rate parameter, this thing negative rho g over a r is lambda. Lambda is rho g over a r. So as I increase my area, what do I see? Well, the denominator gets larger. So for a larger area that decreases the rate at which uh, I equilibrate. That, de that it means it takes longer for my heights to, uh, to exponentially decay to the same value. Meanwhile, um, rho, the density of the water, is, of the fluid, is on top. So more dense fluid will actually equilibrate faster. G, the gravitational constant, is just a constant, but say that I were somewhere that had a lower gravitational constant. In that case, g would be smaller, so my rate would again be lower. The larger gravity, the larger that force pulling me down, the faster I equilibrate. Finally, if I increase my resistance, well then less fluid can flow per unit time, so my decay is going to be longer. It's going to take a longer time for me to, uh, for me to equilibrate. So, <clears throat> height is not the only quantity that I could possibly be interested in here. So, um, for example, say that I wanted to know about the current through this tube as a function of time. Well, current I is just dv over dt, or we say minus dv over dt, depending on circumstance. For now, I'll just call it dv over dt. Uh, the logic will carry over if you throw in the minus sign. So in that case, I can write that as I is area, surface area, which is constant, times h of t differentiated, d over dt of that. So if I look at my formula for height, or the difference in height, say, uh, now I'm looking for the change in volume. Yep, yep, yep. So current is going to be something like I equals A times G over dt of delta H naught times E to the negative rho G over A R T, uh, which is A delta H naught times, okay, I'm going to pull down that exponent, negative rho g over a r, exponential of the same, negative rho g over a r t. So here's what I would get out for current as a function of time. A's will cancel into this. So current is independent of area. Okay, so two reservoirs, some intuitions to take away. Two reservoirs with a connecting pipe. If I've got a highly resistive connecting pipe, that's going to slow down the rate that they equilibrate. Uh, if I've got very large, uh, like large surface area pipes, I have to push more volume. That's also going to increase the, uh, the time that it takes for me to equilibrate. Okay, so this is our archetypal fluid example of uh, exponential decay. Now we're going to pivot over to the electrical analog. So I want to talk briefly or actually not that briefly, I want to talk about what's called an RC circuit. So to introduce an RC circuit, I first have to say what a capacitor is. So a capacitor, it's marked on a circuit diagram like this. So this is a wire, this is a wire. These are two metal plates. Plate one, plate two. Okay, 
And these two plates uh, gather charge. So they each gather charge. So an equation I want to introduce, if there's some charge, say there's positive charge on the right, negative charge on the left. So if each, each of those plates has the same amount of charge, plus Q on the right, minus Q on the left, then I say that the capacitance, C, capacitance, is Q over V, uh, delta V. So that's the change in voltage across the capacitors. Change in voltage across the capacitors. Now, a few things to note. Um, intuitively, what capacitance is, is the ability of the capacitor to store charge. So for a given change in voltage, if I've got a high capacitance, I have a large amount of charge that I'm storing. So the larger the capacitor, typically the larger my plates, uh, the more capacitance, the more charge storing capability the, uh, the capacitor has. So the next thing I'm going to show you is the direct physical analog of the fluid circuit we just talked about. So imagine for a minute that I have charged up a capacitor for you. So I've given you this capacitor. It's got negative charges on one side, positive charges on the other. And what I've, what I've uh, asked you to do is hook it up to a resistor. So what's going to happen? Well, the positive charges on this side of the resistor, on the right side of the resistor, are going to want to flow to... Uh, they're attracted toward the negative charges on the left side of the resistor. They can't cross over this region right here. There's a gap. Uh, there's no place for them to transfer directly across this gap. So they have to go around. So current is going to flow this way through the resistor. Now, uh, as it does this, it's going to... Um, how do I say this well? As it does this, it's going to have to dissipate energy in that resistor. So the change in voltage across the resistor is still governed by Ohm's law. Delta V across the resistor is negative IR. So the voltage supplied by the capacitor initially, whatever that initial change in voltage across that capacitor is, that change in voltage across the resistor is going to dictate the current through the resistor. So at a particular time, if I've got some change in voltage across the resistor, a larger resistor is going to slow down that current. Okay, all right. So, let me real quick um, show a differential equation that describes this circuit. So the way I'll find that differential equation, that, uh, that derivative equation, is by drawing a loop around the circuit and applying Ohm's law. So the first thing I'll hit, if I go here, uh, start from my initial point and hit that resistor, yields that the change in voltage across the resistor Plus, the next thing I hit is my capacitor. The change in voltage across the capacitor is zero. So that takes me all the way around my loop. This is just Kirchhoff's voltage law, um, Kirchhoff's loop rule. Now, recall that the change in voltage across the capacitor is just the charge on that capacitor divided by the capacitance. The change in voltage across that resistor is just uh, dr. So, uh, or sorry, ne negative ir, so Ohm's law. So negative IR plus Q over C equals zero. So check this out. Here's why this is a differential equation. Now current is just minus dQ over dT. It's just a time derivative of, uh, of charge. So this equation reduces to negative of negative dQ over dT times R, the resistance, plus Q over C equals zero. Or rearranging for uh, dQ over dT alone, I get dQ over dT, the rate of change of charge, is just negative charge divided by the product resistance times capacitance. Boom. Bum -ba -da. Okay. So the solution to this equation, as we saw in uh, the first video in this lecture series, is Q as a function of time is going to be some constant. I'm going to call it V times exponential negative 1 over RC times T. All right. <clears throat> and this V, this V is just going to be our initial value for the charge. So that's the charge at time zero. 
Well, Q naught e to the negative 1 over rc times t. Now we could just leave it at that. So this is a this is the how charge flows off of a uh, off of a capacitor. So Q describes the amount of charge on the capacitor as a function of time. QT. Ah, okay. So a few things to note. Number one, tau is R times C. The uh, the time constant for this exponential decay is R times C. Lambda is one over R times C. And that means that the half life, C one half. It's just going to be RC natural log of 2. A few other things that I'll mention. Um, in this class, sometimes you'll see it notated this Q naught as uh, the battery voltage times uh, capacitance. So this is just assuming that we've charged up our capacitor initially with a battery. So if I charge my capacitor directly by a battery, like this, so this is. Before I handed it to you, this is how I charged it. I just hooked it up to a battery, and it has some capacitance. Um, the amount of charge that would initially be deposited on it is battery voltage times the capacitance of capacitor. And that just follows directly from our definition of, here we go, our definition of capacitance. The voltage change across the capacitor is just Q over C. Okay, so the equation for uh, discharging capacitor is given by this equation. Alternatively, you might see it written with Q naught subbed in as uh, battery voltage times capacitance. The next example I want to show, the, uh, the final full example that we'll talk about, is for charging a capacitor. So when we talk about charging a capacitor, uh, there is a new archetypal circuit to discuss, which is called the RC circuit. It says RC for resistor capacitor. Resistor capacitor. So when I go to charge my capacitor, I've got a battery, I've got some kind of resistance, because there's no such thing as a resistance-free system, and I've got my capacitor. If I make a loop, as I did before, final initial, say I go around this way, if I make a loop as I did before, I'll find that I have a differential equation that looks something like this, negative IR plus Q over C plus equals zero. Okay, this is also a differential equation. We can do a similar analysis on it, and uh, I'll just say flat out that when you charge a capacitor, the solution to this differential equation uh, yields that the charge, whoa, the charge on the capacitor as a function of time is just the battery voltage times the capacitance of the capacitor times one minus e to the negative t over rc. Same, uh, same constant, sorry, same tau, same tau. Okay, um, so this is for charging a capacitor, charging a capacitor. What I want to give uh, as just kind of tying it into a little bit more of that mathematical intuition we developed in the previous lecture are the graphs. So when I'm discharging a capacitor, when I'm discharging a capacitor, if I were to plot Q as a function of time, Q, the charge on the capacitor as a function of time, what I would find is it starts out at some initial value, Q naught, and decays slowly to zero. Okay, what do I notice about this? So Q is decreasing to zero. My capacitor eventually has no charge on it. I also notice that the rate at which the charge is leaving decreases over time. My slope gets less and less. That tells me that the current leaving the capacitor also decreases over time. So the way I think of it's like this. Um, initially, the capacitor is chock full of charge. The charges don't really love all being near each other like that. Like charges repel. And they're attracted to all the charges on the other side of the capacitor. So they push each other out at a faster rate. That's how I think of it. They push each other out at a faster rate. As the plates become less crowded, you get less and less charge pushing. And so uh, they push each other out at a slower and slower rate. OK, if I were to take a derivative of, uh, if I were to take a derivative of Q here, I, 
and uh, i is negative dq over dt, i as a function of time will also be exponential. Derivatives preserve rates. Derivatives preserve rates. So if this is i naught down here, the initial rate of current flow, it will also decay to zero. It starts out negative, just gets uh, decays up to zero. Okay. Now when I'm charging my capacitor, when I'm charging my capacitor, the amount of charge starts at zero and then comes up to some higher value. So Q, T, it ends up at battery voltage times capacitance. So it ends up at this asymptote. Still an exponential decay. All right, the last thing I want to look at in this lecture video is uh, the equation for discharging a capacitor with a special eye toward the, uh, the rate parameter. So it's the battery voltage times the capacitance. That's just, this product is just my initial charge. E to the negative T over RC. Okay, so what is the rate parameter here? Well, the rate parameter is this lambda. So here, in this equation, lambda is 1 over RC. So if 1 over RC is a big number, my uh, charge is going to decay really quickly. If lambda is a small, or if lambda is a small number, it's going to take a much longer time to decay. As I increase my resistance, as resistance goes up, that tells me that the rate parameter decreases. It's going to slow down the, uh, the rate of charge flow. Similarly, for capacitance, as capacitance increases, the rate slows down. So to draw this back to our two like uh, reservoirs of water connected by a pipe, R here is like the resistance of the, of the pipe that joins the two reservoirs. C, the capacitance, is kind of like the area of the pipe. It increases the amount of stuff that can be stored on either plate. Okay, so in the next video, I'll be going into a little bit more detail with some intuition builders, and uh, we will wrap up this third lecture. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you next time.